field is different. So you may hear some hard truths that arise from the reality that for those of us who are often the only one in the room, we may have a very different experience from yours as we navigate careers in our acknology. And so the work we're asking of you is to hear and reflect on the truths that we're offering without defensiveness and without centering your own discomfort in your reactions. We also ask that you consider how to apply the insights you gain today to your own work. So with that, again, thank you for being here and I'm really pleased to welcome our panelists. First, I'd like to welcome Jillian Sokorowski, Korowski, apologies, Jillian, who's a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay, pursuing a master's of environmental science and policy. And I think she's just been spotlighted so you can see her. Next, I'd like to invite Mercedes Burns to be spotlighted. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of Maryland. There she is, thanks, hi Mercedes. And then um, third, I would like to welcome Lauren Esposito, who is a curator and Schlinger Chair of Arachnology at the California Academy of Sciences. I think she's just been spotlighted as well, hello. Um, so I'd like to start by writing, launching into the questions. Um, and first I'll ask this, if um, I'd like if the panelists could tell us what was your career path to your current position? And maybe we'll start with Jillian. Great. Um, I guess to be short about it, when I entered at Iowa State University for my undergrad, I came in as animal ecology and I told myself I am going to take the first opportunity related to my major um, that comes across my desk. And that happened to be the Iowa State University Insect Zoo. Um, so as soon as I saw that opportunity, I took it, I applied for the position and I was with the Insect Zoo for about two years. And that's when I decided to move into research with Dr. Haldra Rogers, uh, working with her student, um, Geraldine Kalaor. And so in the Marianas, I worked with them on arachnid projects. And from there, I stuck with arachnids. And now I'm with um, Dr. Mike Draney at Green Bay. So <laughs> that's a great story, Jillian. And I love that you it started with the job was advertised. That's one thing that may come up again. A lot of times people get these opportunities through word of mouth or through networks, and that absolutely is not friendly to diversity. So I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that it started with an advertised position. Um, next, could I ask Lauren if you could respond to that question and tell us about your path? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think, you know, I am sort of an unlikely arachnologist. I'm queer, I'm a Latina who grew up in the United States and I'm a woman. So I think the intersection of those things makes me rather unlikely to have become an arachnologist given the demographics of our society. But um, I attended the University of El Paso in Texas and um, was a really young college student because I had left high school as a way of self-preservation. Um, and so I started college when I was 16 and I um, didn't really know you know what I wanted to do or what I wanted to be or or what I wanted to major in really uh, mostly I didn't want to go to college I wanted to just travel around the country and and see national parks uh, but because I was 16 my parents still had some some power of choice over my life decisions and so I enrolled and majored in biology because I didn't really know of anything else that I wanted to do um, and eventually I, I uh, took a, a course in field biology I think my junior year of college and and I did my project for the for the course was to well and I invented this myself admittedly so it's not super sophisticated of a project and uh, my project was to to dig up fiddler crabs on a beach over the over a spring break uh, and count how many fiddler crabs were right-handed and how many fiddler crabs were left-handed because uh, at, at that time I, there was no study that I could find that had ever uh, documented the right to left handed ratio of fiddler crabs. And I mean, the, the, the results that I came up with make, made it probably pretty clear why that had never been documented. And that's because it was 50 50. Um, <laughs> but needless to, day, to say, it really changed. It really shaped what I wanted, what I discovered that I wanted to do. And that that was field biology. Um, and, and so I applied for an internship one summer at the American Museum of Natural History, not to study arachnids, but to study invertebrate zoology, which is a, a broad field <laughs> and I happened to get paired with with an arachnologist when I when I showed up I think surprise it was a surprise to both of us 
Uh, and and then even still, I didn't really want to, I didn't want to do arachnology, but I didn't not want to do arachnology either. I think my life has been to some extent dictated by not making decisions um, as a way of decision making. And and so I, I decided ultimately I didn't really want to get a job and the the, a good alternative in my mind at the age of 21 to not getting a job was to go to grad school. Little did I know it's much, it's far worse to go to grad school than, than to just get a job, but nonetheless I, I did. And um, I went back to, to the American Museum to work with Lorenzo Prendini for my master's and PhD. And, and then I um, almost quit at, at the end because I, found arachnology to be a somewhat unwelcome place, but I did not. And I was awarded a NSF postdoc. And I went across the coast to the other queer friendly state of California to do a postdoc with Rosemary Gillespie at UC Berkeley, which was a, a very different experience that, than being at the American Museum. It's like very stodgy and old. Um, and uh, UC Berkeley was great. My time there was great, but I still found the field of arachnology to be rather unwelcome. So I quit at the end of my postdoc. Um, and I went into the education world and started working for a, a textbook co publishing company that wrote curricula, um, like for elementary through middle school. And it was like all digital curriculum. It was a really different experience from all my academic training. And it taught me a lot about like work-life balance, for example. Um, and then this, this position, my position now, I'm the curator of arachnology at the California Academy of Sciences, was like the one position that I had always wanted and it opened. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna apply for this one position. And if I get it, then my fate is sealed and I will stop working as a curriculum developer and my path will merge back with academic arachnology research again. Uh, and indeed it did, and, and here I am. Thank you for that, Lauren, and, and thank you for sharing the challenges with, with the environment. We're definitely going to unpack that in the next question. Um, but so next we'll move to Mercedes and then we'll come back afterwards. Hi. Yeah. Okay. Um, I had probably a very familiar path um, to my current position, which is that I went to college thinking um, I was going to be a medical doctor, and that was very much what my parents were hoping for. Um, I went to a small liberal arts school, so everybody is really excellent. And um, I um, I assumed I was gonna major in chemistry and then uh, pre be pre-med. Um, and I took a physiology course. Um, human physiology was full, so I took animal and plant physiology. And uh, we had to do final projects on some sort of physiological behavior um, in an organism. And I chose color change in um, cuttlefish and squid. And I loved the project and the class and the teacher so much that I was like, I don't think I can be pre-med anymore. <laughs> I have to do this. <laughs> I have to do this and focus on this. Um, so um, I was mostly, uh, yeah, I was mostly on scholarship. Um, as a college student, um, I was still getting, well, so there was a Howard Hughes Medical Institute program at my university that I joined. Um, and so I kind of felt like I probably shouldn't be in that institute anymore, except that they lost their funding anyway, but they still had a little bit of funding left to support previous members of the institute. And so they paid for me to take the GRE. Um, uh, including the subject test, which most colleges required uh, for graduate school at the time. And um, I, my senior year, um, except for doing a study abroad, I studied really, really, really hard for the subject test and I did pretty well. So um, I went through a round of graduate school applications and I got into only one of the five schools I applied to. Um, and I was really embarrassed about that and thought I probably wasn't ready for graduate school because I went to a small liberal arts college, I didn't think I knew maybe what I was getting into. And so um, I was working for the Bureau of Land Management at the time um, as a, a federal contractor um, doing wildlife surveys. Um, and there was a woman at my field station who was getting her master's in archeology. span 
So she um, had been working on some field sites, you know, so basically if they find artifacts, they have to work to repatriate those um, to the proper tribes. Um, and uh, she was also just doing a study of, you know, um, northern facing settlements and what they tended to find at certain sites and things. But she knew nothing about statistics and asked me to help her. And through the course of doing that, I was like, I can do this. I think I'm actually better than I think. <laughs> and so I applied again for another round of graduate programs. Um, I also received help from, um, uh, I had done um, the, uh, the evolution um, minority research um, undergraduate program. Um, I think it's a thing they still do um, that had been um, interesting. It was, a, it was a good experience. It paired me with a, a faculty member who had given me advice on my documents and stuff for applications, which is extremely important at pretty much all stages. But um, the, the rest of that experience at the evolution meeting was like awful. And I kind of felt like I don't belong here at all. But um, you know, um, I really wanted to do research. Um, and if anything, like working for the government reminded me of how much I had enjoyed that class and how much I had enjoyed summer projects that I'd done, REUs and directed research at my home institution. So I kind of, you know, pulled myself together. And, and when I reapplied, I got into every program that um, I had tried for which, you know, is a testament to the fact that, you know, just like some mentorship really helped me. And it was just that I had to ask for it, you know, um, there, there weren't as many programs and as much guidance as there is now, and there's still a lot of room for improvement. But um, so I got, I, I did my graduate school interviews. Um, I had a great experience interviewing with um, my PhD advisor, Jeff Schultz. Um, and uh, I just felt like we got each other and we were both really excited about the same things. I had an awesome graduate school experience, um, applied for an NSF postdoctoral fellowship and got it, um, where I went and worked um, in Marshall Hedin's lab, um, but it was on you know, a pretty independent project. Um, and that's really what kind of built up the research program that I have now as faculty. So for the job that I applied for, um, I, I mean, you know, faculty interviewing is so hard. <laughs> um, and um, I had some really weird experiences interviewing um, that were re related to race. Um, oh, I should have mentioned um, I'm biracial, um, but I'm black. Um, so I, I refer to myself as, as black because I don't pass for white and people usually know, you know, that, but um, I, I'm miscast racially all the time, um, and it can be pretty irritating. Um, but the, anyway, I um, I had heard about this transitional program from postdoc to faculty. A few colleges are starting, or a few universities are starting to do this, where they hire you as a postdoc, um, working independently or a research uh, faculty, and then you work for two years, and if the fit is good they take you on as tenure track. Um, so I applied for that position at UMBC. I, I'd seen it on evolution directory, but I'd also heard about it from Jeff and from um, other colleagues in Maryland um, since I'd done my PhD here. And so I applied, I interviewed, um, I felt like I really nailed the interview, but then I interviewed at another school and I got an offer there too. So I was actually able to negotiate my way to a tenure track position from that postdoctoral offer. Um, so I kind of got what I wanted there. Um, and um, so, yeah, so I've been faculty here for four years. Great, thank you. Um, I'm not gonna talk a ton, but I will just offer a few bits of my own experience that haven't been touched on in any of the narratives we've heard so far. Uh, one is that um, I also started pre-med and the reason I decided I wanted to research six months into my first term was because of an outstanding intro professor who did research with invertebrates as well as vertebrates and started every lecture with a, he called it ain't nature grand story. That was really a research story linked to the topic. I'll just say it was Professor Larry Dill, who was a behavioral ecologist from Simon Fraser University. 
Um, so the value of spending time to integrate these things into your teaching is huge. Um, I discovered very quickly, I didn't want to work on vertebrates. I wanted to work on invertebrates. Um, and then the other piece is that my opportunities to start with research came through co-op. So um, Simon Fraser University had a co-op program. I don't know if you have one at your institution, but uh, labs applied to get co-op students, which I know doesn't happen everywhere. And that's a really great way to get students who uh, maybe have some financial constraints and so they can't just volunteer in your lab, but the co-op program is one that they've chosen because they want to see an endpoint that includes a work uh, opportunity, which for me, uh, let me sell to my parents that I wanted to work on bugs. <laughs> so uh, yeah, just to keep that in mind as you go along, that was one bit I hadn't, I hadn't heard from other people yet. But thank you all so much for that. Um, And it's great that all of them were slightly different uh, and took different sort of direct and indirect routes. So I think maybe we will move on to the next bit, which may be a bit more challenging. Um, and that is, uh, I'd really like to hear from each of you. Uh, what did you find to be the most um, uh, challenging aspects of your path into arachnology and how you overcame them? And I think within this case, we'll start with Lauren, given that you alluded to some of those challenges in your discussion. Yeah, I mean, I think at times it's hard to articulate what exactly is the, the most most challenging aspect. I think um, when I started my, a few years actually, and after I started my, my current position, I realized that I was the first openly queer curator in the history of the institution. And it's the oldest natural history museum west of the Mississippi. Uh, it's been around for 168 years this year. Um, so to be, so to have that realization that in 168 years of an institution in the most gay friendly city in America. And I'm the first openly queer curator was, I think um, like surprising, but also made me realize that I had never like worked in a lab with another queer person. I had never had a queer role model or mentor within STEM. And I, I didn't even know that like of any other queer arachnologist, I, I do now, thankfully, but um, I think I, I, I think that I probably like internalized a lot of that challenge and didn't really like acknowledge or or understand what what the challenge was at the time I was experiencing it but it sort of in hindsight it's like my eyes have been opened to how that impacted me and made me question sort of whether or not I belonged in in, in STEM generally but also in arachnology more specifically. Can you, Lauren, can you talk about how you managed to overcome that? Do you just keep chipping away at it or you compartmentalize it or? I mean, that I think, I think for the most part, I compartmentalized it. Um, it. It wasn't something that I ever talked about in the con, like that part of my identity wasn't something I ever talked about within the context of science spaces. And I think that that's something that's frequently encountered by people in the LGBTQ community where they're either directly told that they shouldn't discuss that aspect of their identity in STEM professional spaces, or it's just sort of generally implied. And so I think oftentimes people like file that away and put on a mask when they come into, into work. I mean, and that happens in regards to many other aspects of identity too. I mean, people commonly refer to this as code switching. And it's something that, that I think most of us who have ever been or are a part of a historically excluded group in STEM, like do and experience even without realizing that we're doing it. Thanks for that. Um, maybe I'll next turn to Jillian, if you could talk a bit about what you consider to be barriers. And again, thanks to all of you for sharing these things. Yeah, um, I think the hardest challenge I have ever had to face was the decision to leave a position that um, involved working closely with insects and arachnids that I absolutely loved more than anything in the world. Um, but I chose to leave it due to my um, boss supervisor being very outwardly racist. <laughs> Yeah, that's like super hard for me to still think about because they're still in a position of power. Um, I know that they actively continue to hurt students to this day 
and my institution has refused to do anything about it, even though multiple students have reported this person. Um, multiple students have reported being harmed by this person and knowing the barriers that institutions place um, in front of students to remove their um, offenders is really difficult to have to come to terms with uh, because it took hours of meetings, hours of documenting the things this person did, um, telling as many people as possible so that at least somebody heard us. We got no closure <laughs> from our institution, which luckily I think a lot of the people in our department like agreed, yes, this person is bad. This person should not be in a position of power. But I think in terms of like the actual policy end of things that include HR and the Office of EO, they make it so difficult um, to remove those offenders, which I was so surprised because we had, in my time, just within my um, undergrad, we had five students within a year report this person within one year. And actually in a span of a month, five people reported her. Um, and then when I graduated, I still have people to this day who call me and tell me another person reported them and they're still there. No one's done anything. And that was super hard to deal with. And I, I struggle back and forth to be like, well, do I contact my institution and be like, you need to do something now um, because this has been an ongoing problem. We've known this person is an issue and this is a really important part of our department. Um, so that's been hard to cope with uh, because those more bureaucratic policy barriers are often unknown to students and the routes to which you should go about reporting those incidents and who best can solve those problems. Because we talked to a lot of people in higher power and none of them did anything from deans to Office of Equal Opportunity to HR. And the one thing that they compensated us for, the one thing was being worked overtime. <laughs> that was it. It was um, the financial aspect and not the um, emotional and even um, like the physical aspect of being worked harder than we should have. Um, and it was something I really loved. That was a position that was really hard for me to leave. But luckily, uh, right out of that position, I was um, with Dr. Rogers Lab, whose outlook on inclusivity in STEM made me feel a million times better. And if any of you who don't know who <laughs> Dr. Halder Rogers is, she does um, conservation work in the Marianas, and she strongly believes in including um, you know, Guam natives and people who live in the Marianas, people who that's that's their home, that's what they know, um, versus a lot of um, labs who historically hire people who aren't part of those communities or don't have much connection to those communities or can be insensitive to those communities. And so I was really thankful to be in a lab that really valued diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thanks for sharing that, Jillian. Um, and thanks for the work you did to try to bring that person to account. So one of the sad things about that kind of wait, the narrative that you just shared, there's a few, many things that are sad about it. And one of them I'll just highlight is I want you to think for a minute about the institutions you've been at. And if you were to hear someone is up on charges for racism or sexism, does a name automatically pop into your head? For a lot of us, it does which means quite often these people are well known and it's known that they're causing these problems. It's known that they're brutalizing essentially generations of students. And when you're already underrepresented in the field, it just creates this vicious cycle of self-doubt and external doubt from people who are not judging you fairly. So it shouldn't be just students bringing this to administration. That's some of the work that we as administrators can do. I'm a black woman, but as a professor, I have quite a lot of power now. I can also make it clear to the administration there's reputational risks involved in this, right? In the current context, people cannot afford to just ignore these things if faculty also speak up on the behalf of students. Thank you for sharing that. Um, next, I'll turn to Mercedes. 
Yeah, a lot of things Lauren said really ring true for me as well. Um, although perhaps the difference is that, you know, I grew up in Minneapolis um, and I went to a high school where we had an honors program and I was the only uh, black person um, for all four years of high school in those classes you know, and there were other black kids in my school and I had basically no connection to them, you know, and I was hearing kind of from, you know, people in my honors classes, wow, you don't talk like a black person, you know, where I was hearing from the, the black kids in my school, like, you know, you don't talk like us, right? And so I grew up always being not fitting in, I guess. And so, it's nothing new to me to be in, um, I, you know, I got my PhD in an entomology department. Um, and when a, a black faculty member was hired, I was like, this is, wow, like this is a big change for me, you know, because it was the first time I'd ever even interacted with, a, with black faculty um, in, in STEM. Um, all the black faculty I knew to that point were in social sciences and I really respected them, but I also felt like, you know, um, what I want to do is different. Um, and I was, you know, early, I guess, in my understanding of sort of the connectivity between, you know, um, the, some of the tools we use, some of the, the research we do, even though, you know, I'd helped a person in archaeology on her stats, right? So like, um, I hadn't, had a lot of experience in making those connections. And like I said, I was just, I was just used to being like standing out for what I considered to be the wrong reasons, you know? And I always wanted to stand out for the right reasons of being like really excellent at research. Um, so, you know, I have this perfectionist streak and I was so successful as a graduate student that when I started my postdoc, um, I had a huge loss of confidence um, in myself just because, um, you know, you no longer have a cohort, you no longer have other people around you that started at the same time and are doing similar things. You have to be independent in a way that I kind of wasn't used to yet. Um, and, you know, I had a lot of uh, days, especially in the first year where I was like, I've made a mistake, you know, and it's really shitty to think that after you've gotten like a really prestigious award, but it, do it doesn't fix your problems, you know. Um, yeah, so, um, so I think, um, you know, personal confidence can is like, I feel like I've always been on the top of a really sharp point where it's like, I can be tilted either way. And it, and it you know, um, a feeling like I can handle it. Um, it gets a little bit harder, unfortunately, as you get older, just because like you, you have less sort of people around you and, um, you know, especially in terms of the, the pandemic of this past year, isolation, when you're already feeling isolated in a department where you don't feel like you fit in because you're young, you know, you're black, all your family is in Minneapolis, they're scared, um, you know, and you're getting contacted two and three times a week asking, you know, oh, can you give a talk to my DEI um, workshop and can you give a talk for my department you know and these are people where it's like you know them but like you didn't know they knew you <laughs> and and you get this sense that um you know your race is what they care about most and it's very frustrating when you're like i have so much more to give but you're used to people noticing that about you as a first thing so um so i don't know i think for me it's just one of the biggest challenges has just been you know maintaining personal confidence. Um, and um, uh, the other, and, and this is, you know, across the board, and it, it's something that, you know, seems to be a thing in academia for everybody is financially. I really, I had a good paying job <laughs> before I went to graduate school. And I think that affected my work ethic in positive ways. But um, I was so, um, you know, I was, I didn't think it was okay to ask about money. Um, and I also, every time I went to the financial, you know, aid office for graduate uh, researchers in my college, you know, they would really give me hell for, for bothering them, you know? And um, 
I ended up in a position where, you know, I couldn't pay my next month's rent. And it was because the disbursement of my fellowship, you know, was delayed due to somebody being on vacation. Um, and I didn't feel like I had, you know, any power to address that situation. And I was so embarrassed to go to my advisor about it. Um, but like, I shouldn't have been, and you know, um, I don't know if perhaps I race played into that in any particular way, but I certainly felt like, you know, it was my problem to deal with. Um, and it really wasn't, you know, like I, I wasn't served, um, or treated fairly. And, you know, um, so when I talk to graduate students, I kind of say like, you know, it's okay to ask questions about money and how you're going to financially support yourself. Um, especially for those folks that are already feeling kind of isolated. And, you know, if you've got expectations of your parents that are like, okay, well, you decided not to go to medical school for this. So what are you actually doing with your time? You might not feel like you can go to them either. And that was definitely the case in my, because they didn't understand what the hell I was doing. You know, they were just like, <laughs> They were just like, what are you, what are you studying? Like, or if there's a problem, come back home. And I was kind of like, no, no, like, but, um, but yeah, I kind of painted myself into a corner there and, and assumed I didn't have options or anybody to talk to. And, um, you know, I, I, so that was a struggle for graduate school that um, I hope, you know, increasingly other graduate students don't have to experience that. I think like so many things that, that you just said, Mercedes, like sort of echo, like ring true for me in some ways, but in other ways, like I realize that at least as an undergrad, I had a, this really different experience from I think most other um, historically underrepresented or excluded people like demographics in the US, which is that I attended that I like went, grew up in a all Hispanic community and then went to a university that's like 95% Hispanic. It's like a, a Hispanic serving institution. And so it wasn't until I started grad school that for the first time I was like, oh wait, like is this what it's what it's like out there in the in the world? Um, and I'll never forget that I was I was in like my first class session of my first grad school class. It was evolution, which is like what I wanted to be studying, right? And like the language people used was so foreign to me, like the words. I was like, why, why does everybody talk with so many syllables? It, it didn't, make, it was, I, I mean, it wasn't that I didn't know the vocabulary because I, 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 well, I think I knew most of it, maybe not all of it, but it was more just like the style of talking that I was like, oh, this is weird. I don't, I don't know if this is like, maybe I made a mistake. <laughs> it had a totally, you know, when I first came to Maryland, I, it was so dumb, it was for an anime convention. But it's the same kind of, you know, black nerd culture was not a thing yet, right? Like, you know, Ninja Scroll came out of my locker, like a, a DVD of some anime came out and somebody was like, what is this? And why do you have it? You know, like I, I took it off somebody, you know, so I'm at this anime convention and I was like, there are so many black people here. And I was like, I can't believe this culture existed, but it just didn't, it, you know, and like, People weren't all up on social media, like Facebook started when I was in college. So, you know, you can get a sense of like generally the age that I am. Um, same, same. And yeah, yeah. And and so I didn't know like that people that looked like me were interested in anything I liked. I was used to them not being, you know, and that usually was a source of bullying and torment. Right. So it was just crazy to be like, this is OK now. So like. I think, you know, Lauren and I had opposite experiences, but it leads to this, you know, like people talk about cultural competency and like, and, and code switching and stuff. I didn't know, like my whole life has been about this, right? Because, you know, being biracial, like I've had people say like, you think you're all that just because of how I look, right? And then, you know, in another community, people are like, they know for sure what race you are before you even, open your mouth and say anything. So um, it was just amazing to be like, oh, there are spaces. Oh, you know, and people are like pleased to see you being yourself or trying to. Um, and so it was just like, it, it's, it's weird, but it's also like, it was kind of like being on a trip for a long period of time, you know, graduate school. Um, 
And now, you know, now that I'm faculty, it's like, okay, I have to learn to live within this system and overcome this system. Um, so it's a little bit different, um, but uh, yeah, like it's, it's culture shocking, I guess. Um, for me, it yeah, was just totally culture is. shock to be like, I can actually blend in somewhere because yeah. for yeah. the longest time I never did. And I, I still don't really most of the time. Yeah, there was something else you said, like, I think in the previous question about like going, going to evolution meeting and like that, how intimidating that was. And I will tell you, I have never presented at evolution meeting because I was too intimidated, like this in my entire life up until now. And yesterday I gave my first talk at evolution and guess, you'll never guess what it was about. Not. I know what it's about me. because I saw it. <laughs> yeah, it was about, it was about I DEI thought. work, right? Like, I, right. like my yeah. first evolution talk is not about my research. It's about DEI. So, well, you know, <laughs> I think, I think, um, the role of the society is really kind of pulling pulling itself up now into figuring out how to remove some of these blocks, which, you know, maybe the cultural ones, because like I said, that program um, that was started uh, to increase underrepresented minority undergraduates at the meetings, you know, like that, that's existed for a while. So my first meeting was at Stony Brook, but I had no, you know, like I had an assigned mentor who met with me for an hour and the rest of the time I was on my own. And when I gave a poster presentation, you know, I had like professors from other countries coming up to me and going like, you know, oh, I, I think you should have done this. I think you should have done that. And I was like, I barely got to, <laughs> I studied, a, I got to study abroad. Like I, the fact that I even made like any kind of research happen was largely based on, you know, independent work that I started while I was in another country. And I kind of felt like I've already done so much. And then to kind of go there and not really be prepared for how people will talk to you and how they kind of look at you like, you know, yeah. what are you That's even doing do here? <laughs> right. And then, and then to be at kind of like a mixer and have people kind of go like, you know, are you going to come take away my glass and my cup and my, you know, my dirty dishes? Like, what are you going to do? And like, I've heard of people who've had these exact experiences of, you know, being treated like, um, a server or, you know, um, a banquet, um, a, a busser, dish busser, when they're there for research. Um, and so, I don't know, just um, making someone feel like they belong is not as simple as saying like, here's some money, like that's very important. But, you know, also being like um, interested in their research, you know, and not kind of going into it saying like, well, you know, this person's an underrepresented minority, so automatically their research is not going to be as well funded or as well, you know, received or whatever as somebody who's coming from an institution with so many more resources um, is just like a mindset that I, you know, I mean, we're naming names, but I just feel like evolution has an issue there that they still need to resolve. Um, and yeah. I know they've got a committee that's working very hard at it. Um, and in a virtual space, it's, you know, it's just, it's just freaking hard. So I don't know. I'm I think pause for a minute and ask Jillian. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I think in the, in a similar vein, talking about underrepresentation, um, the APEDA community, the Asian Pacific Islander does the American community, we get accused of being overrepresented in STEM, which is just kind of wild to me on a lot of occasions, because um, I remember looking up in my undergrad, I was like, well, how many Asians are in my major? Like, I don't see any of them. Maybe they're just like hiding, maybe we're in different classes, but my major was pretty small. So I, my institution, you know, makes those records public of our demographics. And I looked it up and there were in my undergrad, um, four domestic Asian students in my entire major. And my friend was the one of the other ones. And we'd make jokes all the time, like, well, where's the other two? You know, <laughs> And we'd be in our professor class and we'd be like, you have 50% of all the Asians in your class right now. You know, and I've gone through different um, diversity, equity, inclusion um, programs, and I've talked to different institutions and they'll be like, well, we don't offer anything for you because you're overrepresented. Um, STEM 
femme doesn't view you as a minority group. I've seen Asians put in separate categories from underrepresented people because we are viewed as overrepresented. And when I think about Asia as a continent, I'm like, we're so big. We're, we're, we, there's so many of us and we come from so many different backgrounds. And for people to lump us all into this one category of like, all Asians are smart. All Asians have a lot of money. All Asians succeed in everything they do was like so wild to me to be like going to all of these like I'm invited to diversity, equity, inclusion stuff, but then I'm told, well, actually you don't belong here because you get everything already, which is super crazy because we face And it's the also same. treating STEM as a monolith too, right? Like, you know, like STEM is, that's like <laughs> four different subjects right there, right? You know, science, technology, engineering, and math. So it's like, okay, uh, really are you are we really overrepresented in every category like I know that's not true you know I know it's not true right right I've never had an Asian mentor in arachnology I've never had an Asian mentor in science in general or education in general I've never had an Asian instructor for any of my courses so I thought this is really bizarre that you're telling me that Asians have a place here when clearly they don't <laughs> and um it's interesting the way that we're treated as um, all of the same and all the same background, especially in the vein of us, you know, studying really hard. All Asians are really, really smart. Um, I'm actually a Korean adoptee. I come from um, a Caucasian family. And so I think a lot of people see Asian people and they assume we all have like tiger parents who make us study really hard. And apparently that also invalidates the work people have, which it, it shouldn't. Everyone puts in that hard work. And I've often had peers and colleagues be like, well, you're Asian, it's in your blood. That's what you do. And I'm like, no, I've worked so hard to get where I am. And you think that my race takes away that success. <laughs> Thanks so much for that, Jillian. It is, as uh, someone put in the chat, uh, the model minority myth that somehow um, certain groups are uh, different. Uh, this is all stereotyping, right? Stereotyping that manifests itself in ways that people aren't always aware. Um, we've also heard about code switching. We've heard about having to wear a mask at work because essentially you need to try to seem to be like the majority group that is there. Um, also, I think about translating academic English and the non-written rules of recruitment, the unwritten rules of being at a conference, all these other things for people. I also just wanna highlight what we heard about conferences. Um, things that people do in passing at a conference or at a seminar or in the hallway can land really hard with someone who's being elbowed subtly for their whole career, right? And what we hear then is that you're being sensitive or overly sensitive, um, that you don't know how to take a joke or all these kinds of things. So one of the analogies I've heard is that for people from underrepresented group, it's like we're walking against the tide on a busy sidewalk and everyone is pushing us slightly out of the way and we're nevertheless trying to make our way. One of the times that we get a little bit of an elbow, we might just hold you to account for that elbow. And that's when we hear that we're being sensitive, but it's helpful to recognize that it really is swimming against the tide throughout our entire career. And we're not blaming you for that, but we're telling you that little things that you might forget and that are just things you did in passing casually can land really heavily and affect quite deeply our ability to stay there. I heard what Lauren said about actually having left at one point because of this. Um, I think we're heading to about quarter to the hour. So I'm gonna see if there's any questions in chat. And while I do that, I think what we will do is just ask people quickly to say on the flip side, can you say something about one affirming positive thing about your career or that you experienced that, that made you wanna stay in the field? Maybe we'll start with Jillian, then Mercedes, then Lauren, and I'll monitor the chat while you're doing that. I found a really strong community, especially in the Midwestern area with other people of color um, and also Asian people, but especially just broadly um, people of color and people in underrepresented groups. Um, I think living in a predominantly white area, a lot of us, you know, we don't get to see a lot of people of even our same race. So when we recognize someone else as part of our marginalized identity, we make that automatic connection of, 
I know you're going through this same thing too. Come in, come in. Like we're here to support you and make sure you feel like you're getting what's necessary to achieve your success and to try and break down some of those unnecessary barriers that you have to face within education. I know in my undergrad, my friends and I, um, we were all part of marginalized groups and we all sat together and, you know, that is kind of a controversial thing, you know, where all the minorities kind of congregate and maybe sometimes we isolate ourselves, but it provided a really strong foundation for a lot of us because if something happened, we knew who to go to, we knew how to share resources with each other, we knew how to talk about those experiences and to provide each other with empathy. And that really made a difference for me to be able to have that community within specifically STEM, uh, because I think that was also really important to us, not just that we were underrepresented people, but we were underrepresented people in STEM studying, you know, animals, ecology, conservation and all of that. And so we could talk very specifically about those experiences. Thanks for that, Jillian. Uh, Mercedes? Um. Uh, two two things, very affirming things. Um, I got advice. So my university has a program for new faculty uh, where they basically encourage you to identify an external mentor um, and um, they pay for you to travel to give a talk at their institution and then vice versa. Um, and so through that, so I chose a mentor based on, you know, um, someone whose work most closely aligned with mine. Um, and she had discussed, you know, having very similar experiences of just kind of the growing pains of looking around your department and being like, I don't feel like I have anything in common with these people. And she suggested, you know, you really need to create uh, or, or identify communities outside of your department um, and, and that will really serve you. So, you know, following her advice, I decided to get more active with the Black Faculty Association at my university. None of these people are in STEM, you know, which is like, but it, it, the great thing is that they treat me like, you know, like we're trying to get you that community, right? And so like, they'll ask my opinion instead of kind of looking at me like, I don't know, it's just, it, it feels like a relief sometime to hear from other faculty who are doing really great work in their other fields um, and just feel like I'm not strange here for wanting, you know, to see uh, better diversity and representation, especially because I'm at a university um, that's not a minority um, serving, like not designated by DOE, but might as well be, you know. Um, so that was important. The other was uh, some of you might know that this past year, um, uh, Rebecca Godwin and Jason Bond published uh, a paper um, on a taxonomic revision of um, uh, trapdoor spiders and they named one after me and as a part of naming it after me they said you know as far as we know you're the only african-american black female arachnologists ever and that was shocking to me but, but you know i did my research as well trying to find somebody um and just thinking about that i i just feel like i it makes me want to work harder to one, uncover the, the Black women that have been working in this field, the Black people that have been working in this field and their contributions were never recognized because they weren't in a position to publish, you know, or they weren't in a position to be known, um, you know, and in other sort of related fields, animal biology uh, or animal behavior, you know, ecology, those people are there, you know, and those contributions just were never recognized. So in some ways I'm like, I wanna work to find out who those people were, you know, knowing that there's probably limitations to what's been documented, but I want to, you know, try to carry that legacy positively. Um, so it was just like a huge honor that makes me want to, you know, keep doing what I'm doing, makes me wanna stay with it um, and try to build up build up this legacy. Thanks, Mercedes. Uh, Lauren, and then we'll go to a couple questions we have. 
Yeah, I mean, I think like Mercedes sort of started exactly what I was thinking, which is that like the reason, I think the, the one of the big reasons that I am, I'm happy to persist in this career, particularly now that I'm in a relative position of authority or power to change is to the potential of changing the culture of science. And, and I think like right now I'm at, I'm on a camping trip with, with 12 undergraduate students who, who are the new face of science and that's encouraging and, and rewarding. And I also uh, had an exhibit in the Cal Academy that launched yesterday. So I'm gonna like drop that link in, in the chat right here, um, which which is exactly why I'm still doing science. Um, and here's another link to something else that I'm really proud of that, that we did this year, um, a statement about how to be more actively anti-racist in ecology and evolution. And um, that's why I'm here. And that's what keeps me going is the potential of, of realizing change. Thank you so much. Um, so we have a question about imposter syndrome. So let me just start by asking the panelists, can you raise your hand if you experience imposter syndrome? Yeah, so I know, let's ask the room actually. Can I just ask for people in the room, do you have uh, experiences with imposter syndrome? So for those of you in the room, <laughs> see that this is not uncommon. Um, uh, thank you very much for doing that. This is not uncommon. So if you feel imposter syndrome, don't think you're alone and talking about it and knowing about it is important because it helps you recognize that it's a challenge that may not be based on you. I will also say though, uh, according to the question that we have in the chat, it is worse for people who are from underrepresented groups to have this feeling because the fact that they don't see anyone around them just reinforces the feeling. The fact that some people are judging them based on their biases about their identity rather than on what they're actually doing just reinforces the feeling. So imposter syndrome really can be a vicious cycle for people from underrepresented groups. And I've had this great uh, experience with a class on bias and one of the students introduced me to a term called microaffirmations. And she said that there's literature that micro affirmations, especially for your students from underrepresented groups can actually do a huge amount. You might be reading their work and thinking, oh, this is great work, I'm just gonna give it a mark and move on. Tell them, tell them it was great work. You know, show them that you appreciate what they're doing because it can be really critically important to them. So thank you all for Sometimes doing that. Sometimes you have to give micro affirmations to yourself too. And one that particularly works for me, I don't know if this will ring true for anyone else, but Anytime I feel like I'm about to do something that I've never done before and I'm really scared about it, like moving across the country from, you know, Maryland to, uh, you know, San Diego and back or, you know, going to Japan and then moving across the country, um, all of these things I've done. Uh, I just tell myself people do this every day and it helps me somehow to just be like, anytime I'm like, oh, I feel really uncomfortable about this. Uh, I feel really anxious. I just say, people do this every day. Somebody is doing this. <laughs> um, it's not just me. It's 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 never just you. And there's a way that will work for you um, that may reveal itself through you know talking to a few people, doing your research, feeling you know like you're prepared as well as you can be. Um, and just go for it, whatever. But like someone's doing this every day is a, a I, is, is that even a micro affirmation? I don't know. I think it, it works is. for me. <laughs> Can I ask you, there's another question here about uh, how Jillian had shared um, issues with injustice in the institution. And uh, there's a question about whether we, any of us have ever been successful in addressing situations in which there was injustice um, and how you managed to face those situations in a way that had some effect based on like money or whatever you think is, is uh, something that would generate sort of um, differential effects for people from I, represented groups. A really quick one for me is that um, a colleague um, made a racial comment to me that was really offensive um, and, and really bugged me out, especially because um, this is like another faculty member at my, at my, uh, in my department. Um, and, you know, I talked to my chair about it. Um, I didn't really get resolution, you know, and then this pandemic, pandemic was going on. Um, but we had to do one of these mandatory microaggression trainings, which, you know, 
the people who really need this stuff are not necessarily going to be there or they're going to be listening, but you know, it, whatever, it was a thing, but it provided an opening for me to just go. And I emailed him and said, I still think about this. I was angered. I worry about how this would affect a student and you need to know, you know, that that was inappropriate. Um, and it was confrontational for me. I, I'd never done that before, but I got a lot of peace from it. Um, and I got a bunch of support from folks, you know, that I talked to about it, just saying like, hey, you don't even have to ask for an apology or whatever. Just like take it from the standpoint of like, what if he says something like that to a student and that really they'll carry that with them. Um, so you, you know, I thought like maybe that will help somebody else. And it certainly helped me just to feel like, okay, I let him know, you know, like don't talk that way to me. And that's not part of the institution that I feel like I belong to, so. Thanks for that, Mercedes. Um, Jillian or Lauren, do you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, I, I, it's hard for me to think of, of a circumstance where I felt like there was a good resolution. Uh, I, like I struggled to, to think of that. I, I'm not, I don't have the bravery that Mercedes does. Um, but one thing I think that, that in, you know, in particular for this society that would be like a pretty good move towards being able to address situations like this is a code of conduct and a code of conduct in particular that spells out clearly what the consequences and process are for dealing with violations of the code of conduct within the society. And I'm, I mean a code of conduct outside of meetings, a code of conduct for all members who belong to the society and what the ramifications are if you violate this code of conduct. And, and this is something that, that certainly other societies are tackling at the moment. I know the, the uh, joint societies that host the evolution meeting, for example, are working with a lawyer right now to come up with a society-wide code of conduct that has clear ramifications and expectations of what happens to people who violate this and violate it routinely. Um, because as a society with many people, collectively we can make change and have consequences for these kinds of situations and improve the culture so that other excluded or minoritized people can participate fully. Thank you for that. Let Jillian uh, go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. Um, in the same vein as Lauren, I don't personally have any experiences where I felt something was, you know, well resolved. But in terms of creating processes and policies that address these issues, I think that is super important. I know when I ran for student government at Iowa State, I really wanted to introduce legislation that didn't allow um, faculty and staff to be bystanders. They weren't allowed to say, I'm neutral on this subject or I won't intervene um, because so many of those instances where faculty and staff go, we can have this conversation which I know will create harmful dialogue and I'm going to tell you that it's not on my hands if you feel harm from it and I think that's really dangerous for a lot of students because then they feel like there's nobody who will step in and so making sure that faculty and staff are held accountable for being bystanders um, especially in instances where faculty and staff will put in their syllabus, oh, we have a diversity, equity, and inclusion policy, and you shouldn't be unfair to your peers. And so many people have this because it's mandatory, but the number of people who actually act on it in class, I, in my personal experience, is very, very slim. Obviously, it's mostly just a requirement and performative for people to put that in there. I've had professors who I've sat at round tables with them where they say, well, I care about diversity, equity, inclusion. I This is something I, I wanna do. And I said, but in your class, these were the actions you took that showed me you didn't actually care, were unable to identify the problem and students were harmed in the process. And it is, I think, much more complex than that. It is also teaching people how to identify these problems. Um, but in the same time, you know, students, felt like there was no support and felt like it was all a facade for a faculty or staff member to say they cared. And then when time came to act, nothing happened. Thank you, Jillian. Um, unfortunately, I see that we're at time. There's some really active discussion in the chat and thanks very much for that. Um, 
A huge thank you to Jillian, Mercedes, and Lauren for sharing their experiences and to all of you for being here. If we could give them sort of a virtual hand, that'd be awesome. Um, it is hard to have these conversations. It reminds you of things that you don't necessarily want to think about too much. Um, but I th think there's value if people hear and think about how it might reflect um, something they can do on their own. Being an ally um, or acting with allyship, even though people don't know like that word as much these days, it basically means not letting these things pass. They seem trivial, but if you center the experience of the person who said the objectionable thing instead of the experience and the way it lands for the person who may have heard this you know, 40 times in the last week, um, you're, you're actually showing something about whether you're performative or you're aligned with what I say is just justice. And I really thank you for being here today. And I think um, I wanna remind you that Jillian's going to be running a workshop immediately after this. And I think Catherine said we were going to take a five minute break to decompress a little or grab a snack or throw a snack at your child, whatever. Um, so I'll turn it over to Catherine, I think, or Jillian, Jillian. Yeah, so we learned a lot, I guess, I think within the panel um, for many of us here about the issues that are presented in academia in STEM. And so with my workshop, I want to, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time. So we're just barely going to scratch the surface on how we can begin to address these issues on a personal level, on an individual level in ways that we can intervene uh, by talking about bystander intervention. So I look forward to being able to talk about that with you all.